Hello, I'm Douglas Haller. I was the head archivist of the University of Pennsylvania Museum for more than a decade between 1986 and 1998. I'm going to take you on a journey in time through the museum galleries. This year, 1999, is the centennial of the first building of the museum complex. Prior to this building, the museum was housed in two other university buildings, and subsequent to this building, the museum added four additions. In 2002, a fifth addition is planned. Provost William Pepper propelled the University of Pennsylvania to the front ranks of American institutions of higher learning. When the campus moved from Center City to West Philadelphia in the 1870s, Provost Pepper constructed several new buildings on the campus and founded many new departments. Among these was a museum. It was his dream to gather under one roof collections that evidenced the development of humanity from the earliest times to the present. Antiquities collected by the university were gathered together in a room in College Hall, which is the building on the right. Unfortunately, no known photographs of the museum in this building survive. The museum was opened to the public in 1889 as the Museum of Archaeology and Paleontology. A year later, the collections were moved to the newly established University Library Building on the left by the noted Philadelphia architect Frank Furness. The building consists of a cubicle stair tower with a cathedral-like nave. The museum collections were displayed up along the stair tower and in adjacent rooms until you ascended to the third floor where the American section was displayed. Entering the main door under the grand staircase was the Egyptian and Mediterranean section. From the earliest times, the museum has been identified in the minds of Philadelphians with Egyptian material and particularly with mummies. Up the stair tower, we see the general ethnology section with materials from East Africa collected by Arthur Donaldson Smith. The ethnographic materials were retained by the museum and the natural history specimens were not. This original albumen print photograph by Philadelphia photographer William Rao was probably taken for the visit of American President William McKinley to the University of Pennsylvania in 1898. On the third floor, we're in the American section. It's hard to believe that this Victorian clutter was the result of the latest European exhibition technique. It was the practice of curators to interpret the collections in person, but as an experiment in this gallery, exhibition labels were used. The first curator of the Egyptian and Mediterranean section, Sarah York Stevenson, worked closely with Provost Pepper to secure a separate museum building on the campus. In this plan of 1890, we see the University of Pennsylvania buildings, College Hall in the center, and the library and museum adjacent to it. Prior to the Civil War, it was very difficult to cross the Schuylkill River, which prevented the city expanding into West Philadelphia. Around that time, monumental bridges were placed across the river at Market, Chestnut, and Walnut Streets, and also at South Street. This enabled the city to expand westward, just as the college was expanding out from College Hall. On a parcel of land between the university and the city, and serving as a metaphorical bridge between the two, the University of Pennsylvania Museum would be erected. Here we see the site looking from College Hall across the South Street Bridge towards Center City and South Philadelphia. The area to the right of the roadway would be the site of the future museum, and the area to the left of the roadway would be the site of the future Franklin Field Stadium. Wilson Eyre was selected as the architect. He was known by the city's elite for his gracious residential structures but this museum would be his largest public structure. 
Here we see the air plan of the complex. There would be three central rotunda devoted to the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome, Egypt and Mesopotamia, flanked by five and a half courtyards devoted to the traditional cultures of Africa, Asia, America and Oceania. The entire complex would be surrounded by a series of pools and fountains in parks and gardens that were filled with plants and trees from around the world. On the lower right, you see the shaded portion, which is the first portion of the structure to be constructed in 1899. This watercolor rendering by Wilson Air shows the projected appearance of the complex upon completion. The portion at the extreme right is that portion that would be first erected in 1899. On this plan of the university from the first decade of the 20th century, we see the first portion of the museum indicated in black and the remaining portion of the complex indicated in lighter lines in the lower right-hand corner of the plan. It has been said that this plan was impractical. If you look at the hospital complex to its left, you can see that already at that time it was about half of the existing size of the projected plan for the museum. It was only in later years when the costs of building materials and skilled labor and the maintenance of large buildings became much greater that it appeared as if the original plan was impractical. It was quite practical at the time. This is the earliest known photograph of the museum, showing it under construction prior to its completion in 1899. At about this time, the institution changed its name from the Museum of Archaeology and Paleontology to the Free Museum of Science and Art, reflecting benefactions by the City of Philadelphia, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and private benefactors. The details of this building were particularly fine. There were mosaics by the Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company. There was sculpture by Alexander Sterling Calder, and there were these very fine white marble reliefs by John Ross of New York City, which symbolized the curatorial collections at the time that the building opened and the general subject interests of the museum. The figure on the left is a Greek youth with a plan of a Doric temple thought to symbolize architecture. Wilson Air had selected the Italian Renaissance style for the structure. He himself had grown up in Italy and admired that style very much. However, he incorporated eclectic elements in the architecture to reflect the internationalism of the collections within. This Asian style entrance gate has often been pointed to as an example of that. Note also in the front of the gate that there is a horse trough horses still being a major mode of transportation at this time. In this color postcard, we see the pristine museum with its red brick and white marble walls surmounted by terracotta roof tiles at the time of its opening. This image looks out from the entrance of the museum towards the second Franklin Field. Franklin Field stadiums would rise in a succession of structures along with the expanding museum, the two structures growing up almost as siblings uh, along the banks of the Schuylkill. We see a school group arriving at the museum in this image. This is the main entrance of the first building with the monumental sphinx of Ramses II at the entrance. When the Sphinx was first brought to the museum in 1913, it was stationed here outdoors, and it was there for a few years until 1916, at which time university geologists cautioned that the ice and snow of Philadelphia was detrimental to the stone. It was brought inside the building at that time and remained there until the Cox Wing was constructed in 1924, as we will see. Entering the main entrance, one ascended a grand staircase to Upper Pepper Hall. The galleries were laid out in the first building as a microcosm of what the entire complex was planned to be. On the top floor, therefore, there were the Greek and Roman, the Egyptian, and the Mesopotamian collections, and on the lower floors there were the Asian, African, American, and Oceanic collections. This central gallery, Pepper Hall, was devoted to the Greek and Roman material. 
As Pepper died in 1898, just prior to the completion of the structure, Sarah York Stevenson saw that the building was turned into a memorial for him, and his bust was placed under this archway as a sort of an apotheosis of Pepper amidst classical statuary. The Victorian fear of empty space led to a quick filling up of this gallery as we can see it only a few years later. Taste, however, changed by mid-20th century, and in the 1950s, the classical materials were presented in a minimalist fashion, as seen here by the museum's exhibition designer, David Crownover. Many of the objects in the museum's collections are monumental, precluding the frequent gallery changes that we are accustomed to in other types of museums. This image also reminds us that workmen are very much part of the staff of a museum, all of the museum staff having their particular roles to play in interpreting the collections for the public. A museum, in effect, consists of collections, buildings, staff, and an audience. On the upper floor were also the Near Eastern collections, as mentioned. Here we see the Semitic gallery with the finds from Nippur in the gallery behind. Notice the skylight in the ceiling. The first building was flooded with light from skylights and windows, and in the evening this effect was maintained by electric lights that you can see coming down from the skylight. In fact, the museum was one of the first fully electric public buildings in the city of Philadelphia. Coming down the great staircase to the first floor, we see the Mesoamerican gallery. Later, this space would become the first cafe and shop as seen in this mid-1950s view. On this floor in the mid-50s was also an exhibit devoted to evolution and the development of mankind over a period of a million years. On this floor was the famous Somerville Buddhist Temple. If you had been a tourist coming to Philadelphia at the turn of the century, seeing the Buddhist Temple and Professor Somerville himself would be something you would not have wanted to miss. Professor Somerville dressed in the robes of a Buddhist monk and toured visitors through the gallery, so attired. He can be seen in the center of the photograph. There was an auditorium on this floor, and the newspaper artist has sketched the visitors to the museum at the time of the opening ceremony. The American section galleries were located here, and in this image we see fashionably dressed schoolgirls visiting the galleries. We don't have a lot of images showing visitors to the galleries in the early years. Fortunately, the education department made it a practice to document visitation of the galleries by school groups, and this has given us practically the only images we have of this type. This was taken in the teens. This shot, also taken in the American section in the 1940s, reminds us that the University of Pennsylvania Museum has been of particular interest to both young people and scholars from the earliest times. On this floor were also exhibited the special collections, such as the fan collection, musical instruments, coins, and engraved gems. Here in the library, the papal fans are being displayed with coins from the Brock coin collection in the distance. The museum had its own library from the earliest times, even when it was located in the university library structure in the 1890s. By the 1950s, the capacity of this library to accommodate the number of books was becoming severely strained, and so it was necessary to add additional shelving in the 1960s. By looking at this, one might think that the artist was being somewhat fanciful with the colors that are shown, but textual documentation indicates that indeed the floor was canary yellow and the bookshelves were Chinese red to match the chairs. George Byron Gordon was museum director from 1910 to 1927. During his administration, three additional structures were added to the original building. During this period, the museum also changed its name once again from the Free Museum of Science and Art to the University Museum in 1913. In this 1915 plan, we see the addition of the first or westernmost rotunda and the first automobile accessible entrance. 
Automobiles were not common at this time, but museum patrons had enough automobiles that it was felt necessary to have an entrance that would accommodate them. It's very difficult to find construction shots of the museum's early buildings. This one survives by chance in a university songbook. The idea was to capture the statue of Benjamin Franklin in the front, but in the distance we see the rotunda rising before the dome has been added. In this image we see the completed Harrison rotunda and dome on the far right. The original complex that opened in 1899 that had been changed into the Pepper Memorial as I mentioned featured two things. On the right we see a terraced park where one ascended small flights of stairs up to the monumental bronze statue of Pepper by Carl Bitter. In the museum buildings one ascended several staircases until one reached Pepper Hall with the bust of the founder. Pepper and Harrison had been social and political rivals in life and after Pepper's death, this rivalry continued to be expressed in the expansion of the museum. Harrison succeeded Pepper as provost of the university and chairman of the museum board, and the Harrison Rotunda would now overshadow the Pepper memorials. In later years, 33rd Street was cut through this complex, separating the park from the museum, and the park was eventually changed into a parking lot. The Harrison Rotunda was an architectural wonder. It was a revival of ancient Roman construction techniques using nothing but masonry. There is no steel whatsoever in the construction of this structure. It is 90 feet high and the floor has a 90 foot diameter. This is the opening scene in 1916 of the Harrison Hall and at this time, there were a number of Chinese antiquities which had come on the art market, and Director Gordon asked that they be exhibited in the hall so that museum patrons might buy them for the museum. And this was done, and, and many did purchase materials for the museum's collections. At the base of the rotunda was an auditorium with its own dome and these con masonry construction methods permitted a pillar-free space in this auditorium with unobstructed views of the stage anywhere from the auditorium. These are elementary school children in the auditorium, in the teens. Eckley Brinton Cox was one of the museum's major patrons. He was fascinated with ancient Egyptian civilization from childhood, he personally financed several expeditions to Egypt and Nubia, and when he died in 1916, he left a considerable endowment to the museum to continue its Egyptian research. He's shown in this portrait with one of his favorite items from Nubia, a statuette of Merer. And after his death, a wing was erected to house the collections that he cherished. The Cox Memorial Egyptian Wing, seen on the left coming out from the Harrison Rotunda, was the first of the connecting links to be built in the air plan. It was intended to connect the westernmost dome with the central rotunda. This is the opening scene of the Cox Wing in 1926. Although the structure was completed architecturally in 1924, it took almost two years to move the collections in because they were so monumental. We see here the remnants of the throne room of the pharaoh Merneptah and the sphinx of Ramses II that we had encountered earlier. Uh, when the Cox Wing was built, the Sphinx was brought around the exterior of the building and brought into the gallery before it was completed, and it is bricked into that gallery permanently at this point. The museum's Egyptian collection also has a number of very fine Ramesside pieces, and this gallery is interesting because they are the remnants of the palace of a son and the sphinx of a father. The sphinx was associated with the temple of Ta, also in Memphis where the palace was. And they are both non-funerary in nature, which is unusual for Egyptian antiquities in American museums. 
This is a reconstruction of what this throne room would have looked like by museum artist Mary Louise Baker. This is a very large watercolor, which is one of the treasures of the archives. In this image, we see the upper gallery. The Cox Wing consisted of two main halls uh, on the two different levels, and they were flanked on each side by smaller galleries. The sculpture is seen in this gallery. Originally, it was intended that the architectural remnants of the throne room would be displayed at full height in this gallery. But unfortunately, due to a misunderstanding with the architect, that couldn't happen. The weight-bearing capacity of the floor in the upper gallery was not sufficient to maintain the weight of the materials, and so the architectural elements had to be displayed side by side in the lower gallery, and the sculptural material was put into the upper gallery. It was intended that the wall at the rear would eventually lead to the central rotunda, but when that was not constructed, a window was put into that wall, and today that looks into the stacks of the museum library. We don't know what has happened to the chandeliers that were original in this gallery. They have completely disappeared. This is the mummy room in the Cox Wing in the 1930s, having a very tomb-like appearance. And this is the mummy gallery in the 1950s, reminding us again that mummies have been a very strong identification with the University of Pennsylvania Museum and the minds of Philadelphians. Eldridge Reeves Johnson was another of the major patrons of the University of Pennsylvania Museum. He was the founder of the Victor Talking Machine Company. He financed several expeditions uh, of the museum, one to Ur in Iraq, another to Piedras Negras in Guatemala, that resulted in some of the most spectacular finds. He also purchased stellar objects for the museum's collections, including the rock crystal sphere of the Chinese Empress. He was the chairman of the museum board in the late 1920s, but few have remembered his major contribution to the construction of the administrative wing in 1929. He declined to have this wing named for himself, calling it instead the administrative wing, which reflected its purposes. In this public ledger rotogravure, we very fortunately have a construction shot of the administrative wing, which, as I mentioned, are very, very hard to come by. The purpose of the image was to show how Franklin Field Stadium was filled for the Penn Navy game, and only incidentally does it preserve a, a construction photograph of the museum, but we're very lucky to have it. The two expansions of Franklin Field Stadium in the 1920s and the two expansions of the museum in the 1920s, along with the construction of the Irvine Auditorium and the completion of the White Pavilion of the hospital, transformed this stretch of South and Spruce Streets into one of the most monumentally elegant corridors in the city of Philadelphia. And I mentioned how the stadium and the museum had grown up uh, over the years, and here we see them now at full maturity in the Roaring Twenties. This is the facade of the administrative wing upon completion. It would have been the main entrance doorway to the entire complex, which explains why the, uh, the portal treatment is so elaborate. You see a major driveway leading up to it, which would have taken people to the central rotunda and a 2,000-seat auditorium, which was planned for the base of that rotunda. The architects of the administrative wing were at this point Day and Clowder, and they were also responsible for the architecture of Franklin Field Stadium at this time. And you will notice a tremendous architectural harmony between these two structures, with a series of monumental arches below, topped by pairs of smaller arches, and Franklin Field Stadium is, in effect, uh, an austere echo of the more elaborate museum. Note also that the museum still towers above the skyline at this time. It is not yet encircled by taller structures as it would be in later years. Here we see some of the marvelous details of this wing. The 1929 administrative wing had very, very fine architectural detailing, as did the 1899 building. And when it was possible, they retained the same artisans who had worked on the original structure. 
These statues on the gateposts are by Alexander Sterling Calder, who you will remember had done the sculpture on the 1899 wing. Calder is best known in Philadelphia for the Swan Memorial Fountain at Logan Circle, which he also did in the 1920s. He is the son of the Calder who did the statue of William Penn on the City Hall and the father of the Calder of Mobile fame. And in these sculptures, he represented the continents. They are, in effect, continental personifications. The one on the left uh, is a detail showing North America, and the one on the right shows Islamic Africa. He was uh, questioned after these were uh, put in place by the architect as to whether the workmen had made an error by facing them towards the museum as opposed to towards the street and he replied that the museum was so withdrawn in character that it was better for the world to face the museum. This is the members room in the administrative wing. I mentioned that this wing was largely dedicated to administrative purposes including collection study rooms and this was one which was specifically set aside for members. The director had his office in this wing, the board did, the education department. There were uh, a number of study facilities and only a few gallery spaces, largely transverse galleries, on each of the corridors of each of the three floors. There were two floors for storage below. And in this photograph, which is showing the excavation for the 1971 wing, you can actually see some of the storage floors below the ground level. When uh, the 1971 academic wing was added, they had to destroy the stair tower on the east end of the complex, which is what you're seeing. Here we see some of the traditional storage methods at the museum which will be brought up to state-of-the-art storage conditions when the 2002 wing is completed in the future. The directorship of Froelich Rainey after World War II was a very interesting one. Rainey revived the research reputation of the museum internationally by conducting stellar research projects around the world. But unfortunately, the earlier buildings and the collections suffered somewhat during his administration. In the late 1960s, a plan was accepted by architects uh, Mitchell and Jurgela to add an ultra-modern wing onto the museum buildings. We are looking at the rear facade, which is not easily uh, seen anymore because the Penn Tower Hotel has been erected uh, on this parking lot site, and it's very, very difficult to see this aspect of the building. By contemporary taste, it is uh, the most pleasing aspect of the academic wing because it continues the building materials of the original structure, and it also extends the harmonious proportions of the original building. Here we see the interior courtyard view of the academic wing where it meets the uh, original air complex. It is, in effect, a concretization of Rainey's administration, which was to add a modern anthropology department onto a traditional archaeological museum. The academic wing did provide uh, some very important needs for the museum. In the center is the potlatch materia, which eventually became the cafe. Uh, there was expanded space for the library. There were uh, offices for the education department. There were offices and laboratories for the anthropology department. And it solved one of the problems that the institution had wrestled with for many, many years, which was how to receive large school groups and to channel them into appropriate portions of the museum for their tours. And what was created, in effect, was a corral in this uh, Cress gallery entrance so that buses could pull into berths and unload uh, large groups of children, and then they could be rounded up and directed in, uh, into areas that they needed to be shown. This is a model of the museum complex uh, showing all of the portions of the structure that we've discussed up to this point. In the front, you see the 1899 courtyard. Uh, behind it is the 1915 Harrison Rotunda. Adjacent to that on the left is the 1924 Cox Wing. Uh, in the front is the 1929 Administrative Wing. And behind it is the L-shaped 
academic wing of Mitchell and Jurgla, a five-story structure with pedestrian bridges that united the disparate elements of the original air plan into a unified whole. Uh, coming out from this wing and enclosing the courtyard on the left will be the wing that is planned for 2002. This is a model of that planned extension by Atkin, Olshan, Lawson, Bell, and Associates. It has an inventive dual personality. On the sides that face the original air complex, there is a sort of a postmodern interpretation of the architecture of the earlier structures. The materials are matched, the coursings are matched, a very harmonious blend. And on the rear, which uh, is adjacent to the Mitchell and Jurgala academic wing, the modernism of that wing is that in this view, but it's there. Uh, after more than a century of construction, through the efforts of four museum directors and three distinct architectural partnerships, the University of Pennsylvania Museum will be complete. The final wing will simultaneously greet the new millennium and commemorate the centennial of the 1899 building. It will provide for state of the art, storage for the collections, and additional rooms for the study of the collections. To return in closing to our centennial structure, and make the point that there is a timelessness about the first building and particularly the upper courtyard where very little has changed uh, over the period of a century. In this late 19th century view we see the upper courtyard. In this mid 20th century view we see the same upper courtyard, very little changed. And in this late 20th century view of the upper courtyard, we see very little change. This, by the way, is myself emerging from the door, caught by a photographer uh, by happenstance. And if you visit the University Museum and visit this courtyard in particular, you'll be able to experience its history and be part of its history as well.